Welcome to uh, my blog site, uh, Bishop Bates, CEC, um, and um, dot org, and hope that if you found it somehow that you'll subscribe, and more importantly, would you be um, my ambassadors, if you will, and tell others about it. Put it on your Facebook page or, um, or on Instagram and, and draw people to come and listen. I really believe that God has given me some things to say over the last uh, 40 plus years as a, a minister of the gospel. We've been working on or working through Ephesians, and I'm calling it a cruise to Ephesus. And um, I've given you, I'm giving you reflections and thoughts, not really a Bible study, although somewhat looking at the text and, um, and then kind of unfolding. So it's not a verse by verse, it's not expository, although maybe we can do some of that down the road. There are several periods of history that dramatically changed the course of Christianity. We could argue about the list, but there are some dates that all Christians would agree. For example, the first, what's called the first four ecumenical councils, although there's seven of them, the Church Universal would agree at least four. The Council of Nicaea, which was 300 plus years, 325 after uh, the birth of Jesus. Constantinople, which occurred 300, uh, in 381, which dealt more with uh, what Nicaea dealt with. Council of Ephesus in 431, and the Council of uh, Chalcedon in 451. These councils uh, over this period of time uh, define the person and the nature of Jesus Christ and are, in essence, uh, the things that are necessary to be believed as a Christian, if you're going to be a Christian. Uh, I teach and I believe that you have to get Jesus right if you're going to get anything right. If you get him wrong, then you're going to get everything else wrong. Um, and these councils define what it, who Jesus is as a person. Um, there's other councils, like I said, there were seven, but there is disagreement as to the importance or the necessity of these councils. The next date would be the Great Schism of July 16th, 1054 AD, when the four patriarchs of the Eastern Church, what's now called the Eastern Church or the Orthodox Church, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, separated from the Patriarch of Rome. So there were there were originally five patriarchs, the four of the East, and Rome was included in that, but in 1054, there was a separation. And some things happened after that, which are making it very difficult for the two churches to get back together, important things. But since that, we can rejoice, at least in my lifetime, I can rejoice that there's a great movement has been made by, by these patriarchs to get back together and be a visible uni unity. To have seen in my lifetime is amazing to see the patriarch of Constantinople, um, the, the Coptic patriarch, and, and uh, to get together, to see them in one place. Now, given that unity, and we all desire it, there's still, we need to deal with the, what's called autocephalous churches. That's not a disease, it means independent churches. Uh, in the East, as well as the church in Russia, uh, which some say is a sixth patriarch. And of course, the Ethiopian Christians, again, the Coptic Christians. And uh, that's much too complicated for me to discuss on a podcast. Uh, and you can find that information online. The other dates, after the Great Schism, the other date in history of the Western Church, never happened in the Eastern Church, is October 31st, 1517. The church was already divided between East and West. Those in the Western church knew very little of the Eastern church. They knew a lot about Muslims, but they knew very little about Orthodox Christianity. And on that date, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. Now, most scholars agree that this is the beginning of what we know as the Protestant Reverend. Reformation, not a protest, but a seek for purifying the church. And it's the beginning of that Reformation, which later bloomed in Geneva, Switzerland, with Jean uh, Calvin and uh, Zwingli around 1519. 
And with the breaking away of the Church of England in 1564, when there was this blend of Calvinism and, uh, and Catholicism, and what we know as Anglicanism. Another important date associated with this Reformation is the Roman Catholic reaction from 1545 to 1563. That's called the Council of Trent in Trento, Italy. I hope to go there someday. Uh, it's really this council that put a nail uh, in the coffin of any desire to bring the Church of Europe into unity. The only unity was seen after that is that all the Protestants repent and return to Rome. However, a new hope sprung in another significant day in some of our lives, our lifetimes, and um, that was Vatican II. From 1962 to 1965, Vatican II opened the door in the Roman Catholic Church to correct errors. And I use the word lightly because I can't think of another, but it, it was a correction, a, a, a source of reform. And um, so it's something new, a new, new breath of the Spirit. I think it was John, John the 23rd says, it's going to open the doors of the Vatican to the wind of the Holy Spirit. The Protestant Reformation and the Council of Trent and what happened in them goes back, way back to um, get a little history lesson, to the birth of humanism and the Renaissance of the late 14th century. And it came to maturity in the 15th century. Well, let's give you these times to give you a sense of how long ago and how long it's been going on. And this humanism is not what we know today. It was a system of thought a guy named Erasmus was a real leader in it. But it's a system of thought that placed the emphasis on the centrality of man rather than God and on his intellect and his goodness. It influenced the men of the, of the, Reform, of the revolution in America and France. And Christian humanism tried to combine humanism's focus on the material world, science, and rash being rational, rational and reasonable, and so sign and the love of studying, and it combined it as it combined it. It became to put the emphasis in the person, and so there was a more personal understanding of faith rather than the church had the faith and I just embraced it. There was this journey within each person to have faith uh, in God. And this, this uh, humanism gave birth uh, to, to human achievement in the areas of science and art, uh, education, medicine, and a host of other things that today we take for granted. Man, they believe, was good and had the ability to understand and manipulate uh, his environment all for the good of humanity. And the church it led to movements, particularly in Germany and England, that looked at removing uh, all the supernatural from, and the mysterious from Christianity. In other words, if we could, we could remove that, we could study the Bible uh, using what's called the historical critical method, um, rather than relying on revelation, rather than relying on, relying on what the church has taught over the centuries, um, uh, certainly not looking at the ancient church. There was a, a sense that man is progressing, man is getting better, uh, that we are, have more understanding and insights into the ways of God than they had in the first century. And so we had to interpret things in light of all the modern and, um, revel not revelations, but modern understandings uh, that, that uh, man had discovered. So the miracles became really, really symbolic. Uh, it didn't really happen, uh, but they were told to try to teach a lesson. So Jesus really didn't walk on water. Uh, they just uh, said that he did, and, uh, or he didn't really heal the sick, or that um, there was just natural healings. So, and then the, that the disciples wrote this, the authors wrote it to kind of show who, how important Jesus was. But it really got down to Jesus was just human. <laughs> and uh, he was the best and greatest human that ever lived. Um, and so everything had an attempt to explain it away. 
even the resurrection was to be questioned. As recent, as, we see this as recent as in the 1980s. Um, one of the person was uh, an Episcopalian named Jack Spawn, but there were m many others um, who explained the resurrection away as a spiritual encounter by the apostles. In other words, they didn't really encounter the risen Jesus. They had a collective spiritual experience, and um, and all of us today have that same spiritual experience, and therefore we believe Jesus is resurrected. So, um, and there are still many uh, who live in kind of uh, Missouri skepticism, a show me, uh, explain it to me, rationalism and reason, uh, trying to understand everything that is, this, this need to answer the eternal question of why, and, and the notion that we can, we can answer that question. So what happened in, in the West, particularly in, in the Protestants, a central act of worship was no longer the mystery of the Eucharist, no longer the mystery that Christ was present in bread and wine, because you had to explain that away. So it became merely symbolic. Um, you couldn't have a sense of mystery. You couldn't have a, a sense of uh, uh, the supernatural. And so preaching became the center. And as if we went into many Protestant churches, um, even today, in the more traditional Protestant churches, you come in and you find the choir in the back, and so we're going to sing hymns together, and then a pulpit. And the preacher would stand, it's at the center, and he was going to give a very long sermon explaining the scriptures or raising questions. And in many cases, he wore an academic gown. Uh, he had his, his hood from the, 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 where he graduated from seminary or from college, along with a kind of black gown, look for titles like doctor, uh, so-and-so, or the reverend. Um, and uh, unfortunately today, what we find in many churches is uh, the band is the center. And uh, although at some point it'll be the same experience, that a preacher will come out, although he usually doesn't wear, he wears, doesn't wear garbs, he might wear a Hawaiian shirt and blue jeans, but he'll give a sermon and that'll be, this, it'll end with that and uh, taking up an offering or a ministry time. So it was in, in the exploration of the unfolding in Scripture that Protestants began to say, this is how we experience God. So um, that's increased in the American church. That's really the heritage of American Christianity until uh, the coming of the immigrants in the uh, in the Northeast, in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, um, the state of Maryland, where Catholics uh, were the center. Uh, and uh, they just began to overwhelm um, um, the Protestant churches of congregationalism and Unitarianism and Universalism that was popular in England, or the Quakers in Pennsylvania. But Christianity, Christianity is a faith uh, based on uh, not just grounded in the visible. Remember we talked about the Nicene Creed or the Nicaea. They gave us a Nicene Creed, which it says we believe in the visible, that God became flesh and dwelt with us, but also in the invisible, that which is unseen. And our eyes need to be open to be able to see that unseen as real. In fact, I would suggest it's more real than what we see, because what we see is perishing, including ourselves, while his word or that truth that is proclaimed through the scriptures and through the church endures forever. It's beyond generation. And there is in that truth mysteries, and you can't explain mysteries. Mystery, by definition, is a mystery. So as a pastor, people would come up to me and say, can you explain that mystery? I go, no, and nobody can. You have to just, you have to just determine it's a mystery that will never be understood. I think that that's true, true of the Eucharist, which I believe is the body and blood of Jesus. Um, that that's what Jesus proclaimed it was, and then he doesn't explain it. And I think 
the, the, some of the, the, the failure of the church was to try to explain it or not explain it. And we got into this big division rather than just embrace the fact that it's a mystery and you walk in mysteries. That's how you learn if they're true. Mysteries are revealed to us, not discovered. And faith, ultimately faith, doesn't come from information. It comes from revelation. There are very few examples in the history of um, the greatest theologians, the greatest men of faith, where they came to, the, to an experience with Christ through information. Perhaps C.S. Lewis is the only one that I can actually think of. The rest came through a revelation given to them, and they began to embrace it and to live it. And throughout the Gospels, we see this. One hears the word, and then one's eyes are open to see. You know, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And when you hear it, you'll see. And what we see is something that's already there. We didn't invent it by opening our eyes. We just didn't see it because our spiritual eyes were closed. So, for example, if you look at Scripture and you study it, let me suggest that the Word, we talk about the Word of God. The Word of God is not the Bible, it's Jesus. The Word of God is called the Word of God because it, it, portray, it reveals Jesus. And so all of us should come to worship with the words on our lips that, that we want to see Jesus. To open our eyes, Lord, that we may see him, as an old chorus used to sing. We want our eyes open like the, remember the, the men on the road to Emmaus who are, who are questioning what had happened in Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, you remember the story, Jesus comes along and explains to them how everything in Scripture that deals with him. And of course, the Scripture he's talking about there is not the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. He's talking about the Old Testament. And then they said that our eyes were open and we knew him in the breaking of the bread. See, the revelation that their hearts were set on fire in the scriptures. And I, I, I love the scriptures. I, I read them all the time, sometimes two, three times a day. And uh, I like to memorize them. I want to know the stories. And it sets my heart on fire when I hear a really good sermon. And there's some great preachers out there. But they knew him. Their eyes were open in the breaking of the bread. I'm not surprised that the church is growing in countries where charismatic renewal and Pentecostalism is rampant. And if the mainline churches of those countries are growing, and some are, uh, I think of the church in the, the uh, Episcopal Church in uh, Brazil, um, it's where they are influenced by the charismatic movement where the miraculous happens because people don't try to understand the mysterious, but live in the mysterious. The mystery that Paul is unfolding to the church in Ephesus is something that we should today say is obvious. That the covenant, the life of the covenant is open to both Jew and Gentiles. It's surprising to me that the Jews did not see this because the Hebrew scriptures were clear but they are only clear in that they point to this inclusion at the coming of the Messiah. It is the reality, in reality the identity of Jesus that is the mystery here, that he is the Messiah because he is the Son of God who has taken on our humanity and made peace and recon reconciliation in his suffering on the cross. That's what Paul is getting at. I'm enthralled by um, how vast the universe is, and the numbers that describe the, the size of the universe, trillions of light years. I have no idea of how to put my hand around that. As much as I am enthralled by the universe, I'm also enthralled by how little I know about the universe in which I live, and how small I am when it comes to those sizes and distances between planets and stars. And I think even those who know far more than I do about the universe, they too are small in light of that mystery. And yet scripture reveals that Jesus is the one who created the universe and the one who holds it all together.
what a tremendous, awesome thought. Or as, as young people go, I'm certainly small. If I keep my mind focused on the earth, I see how small I am. I certainly want my mind expanded, but I walk in the reality every day that there's a sun that comes up and goes down, but all of that stuff out there is real. I've, I've had to travel a lot, and yet I've not been to most of the places and cultures on, on my home planet. And anything I know about those places has been made, made known to me through the media, not through my having been there. I'm excited uh, uh, to be traveling this uh, summer uh, in an RV going up the East Coast, which I've done passing through things, but I'm going to stop this time. Uh, I, what I'm trying to say is, like, for example, I've never been to Wyoming, but I know it exists because I've met someone from Wyoming. I walk by faith that they're telling me the truth. And I'm excited, like, going that as I'm going up the coast. I'm looking forward to traveling this summer and uh, we're actually, Kathy and I will be going to some of the Civil War battlefields and to the Amish country and places that uh, we've never been to see them. But I believe they're real. I've been told that. I've been told about these great battles that were fought there and places like Antietam where 20,000 people died in one day. We're overwhelmed at, at the Trade Center, which was, uh, you know, a couple thousand Ephesians is so exciting because it's about the unseen kingdom, about a kingdom and a temple that are being built where God dwells in our midst. The very existence of mankind is a mystery. The question is, how are we in the image of God? How are male and female one? How does the image of male and female reflect on uh, or make known the oneness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He is unity. A man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and shall become one, become unity. And from this unity comes life. Not just physical life, but life that comes from God. And so later we're going to see in Ephesians that Paul calls marriage a mystery of the love between Christ and his church. And of course, the greatest mystery to me is the source of life, is the Eucharist. Jesus unfolds mystery, um, which men are trying to explain throughout the centuries. The present day tension over the Eucharist and the transubstantiation comes out of that attempt to explain something. Thomas Aquinas, bless his heart, a great theologian, has tried to get this mysterious Eucharist understood in light of the Protestants trying to explain away the mysterious. I found it helpful in all of this, really, to go to the Eastern churches since they never went through a Renaissance or an Enlightenment and humanism. And, and what do they say about the Eucharist, about the body and blood of Jesus? They just say, it's a mystery. And they avoid the discussion. They just live the mystery. And, and I think we need to recover that. Mystery understood by living mystery. The Trinity, we're coming up next Sunday on Trinity Sunday, uh, as I'm recording this, and uh, you can't explain the Trinity. I told the, the person that's asking me to preach at Church of the Resurrection in Wichita that I was going to get up and explain the mystery finally and that they'd all understand it. And of course he laughed because he knew I couldn't do it, and I said it tongue-in-cheek. But we're to walk in mystery. You know, the scripture says, walk in the mystery of love and faith and hope. No wonder we're not told to understand love, but just to walk in it. Not to understand faith, but just to walk by faith. The unseen, to be a people who walk not by sight. And in the hope of Christ, it gives us hope no matter what the circumstances around us are saying. Well, we're going to continue this um, next time on the same theme and hope you're enjoying and learning and growing in your walk with Christ and who he is. 
as well as your cruise to Ephesus. Father, because your mystery doesn't mean you're unknown, but you make yourself known in the breaking of the bread. You make yourself known in love. You make yourself known in the midst of the church with all this tension and all its struggles. You make yourself known at the birth of every baby. You make yourself known in the mystery of a marriage and family. So many ways you reveal yourself and in, in, uh, in just looking at nature, the sun that rises and sets, the moon and stars at night, the power of the sea and the oceans. You make yourself known. And above all, you make yourself known in your son, Jesus, who has come to dwell in us and with us. And we pray in his name. Amen.